OK, hello, good morning. Um, uh, so today is once more on uh, Putnam on brains in a vat. And we'll carry on with Putnam on um, Wednesday. Yes, right, today's. Yes, Wednesday. OK, and then we'll wrap up Putnam. And move on to Dretschke. Um, I, I want to make, well, today I want to look at what, I, I begin by just first going over uh, what Putnam's um, point is about the causal theories, implications for skepticism, and then look at a couple of special cases, what this argument against skepticism implies about your knowledge of other minds, um, because one part of skepticism, one form of skepticism, is skepticism about other minds, and ask how um, Putnam's thing bears on that. And then finally look at what Putnam's proof uh, that we're not all brains in a vat, uh, tells you about your knowledge of your own thoughts. Um, Descartes famously thought that your knowledge of your own thoughts is the most certain thing from which you begin in knowing about anything at all. Um, and Putnam's proof seems to me kind of shakes that up a bit. Um, but I want to begin with a couple of remarks. First about, I think anyone's first reaction to uh, Putnam's proof is that this is some kind of ridiculous trick, um, and it can't possibly be right. Um, but there is something, um, how should I say, something resonant about it. There's, something, there's some important thing that is right about this proof, um, which is, if you think of classical responses to skepticism, um, well, skepticism says the world might be one way, and your mind might come completely adrift from the world, Right? They might not be in sync, your mind in the world. What your mind's thinking might be completely different to what's actually going on. Um, and one classic answer to that is idealism. To say there is no more to the existence of the tables and the chairs. There is no more to the existence of other people even than me having sensations, than me having ideas. That's all, that's, that's all you all are. <laughs> Just a bunch of sensations in my head. That, um, now, if that was right, then skepticism would indeed be impossible, right? Because skepticism says maybe your mind is coming adrift from the way the world is out there. So, uh, idealism kind of shrinks the world to the size of the mind. Um, and that's how it gets the effect that the world can't come adrift from the mind. Um, Putnam's picture is kind of the opposite of that. It's that the world can't come adrift from the mind because according to a causal picture of how we have meaning and reference in the first place, the mind, the, the world actually invades the mind. The world shapes the mind in its own image. Um, it, it, it's because the mind is not independent of the world. The mind has the representation that it does only because the uh, world shapes it. Um, therefore, the mind can't come adrift from the world. So if the mind is constituted by the way the physical world is, then you get that anti-skeptical thrust. And there's something very powerful about that background picture. On the other hand, uh, so that's, I think, one reason, one background reason why Putnam's thing is very important. That there is a background picture there that has something right about it. Um, it seems like a healthier response to skepticism than idealism. On the other hand, there is a feeling that Putnam's proof can't be right, that it must prove too much. I mean, that it seems to me, people have been trying to find responses to the skeptic for thousands of years, right? Philosophers have thought for thousands of years about, if someone says to you, You're a bra you might be a brain in a vat, or you might be dreaming, how can you prove that they're wrong? But it seems to me that we don't actually want a proof that they're wrong. What I mean is, suppose you have a brain in a vat. Suppose there it is, it's all wired up. As you can see what it's thinking, suppose that we have it on a TV screen, what the brain is thinking. And um, you can see that now it thinks it's riding on horseback, now it thinks it's singing in an opera, now it thinks it's puzzled by abstract philosophical puzzles. And um, if the brain gets... Uh, 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 you can see that, let's suppose, that the brain is getting gripped by an abstract philosophical puzzle. It thinks, maybe I'm a brain in a vat. But then you just feed it in Putnam's proof 
that it can't be a brain in a vat. And I think, oh, thank God. Until I read Putnam's proof, I was really troubled by the thought that I might be a brain in a vat. Um, but now I can see clearly that I'm not. Uh, I mean, if you have a really good proof that skepticism is wrong, then it's going to be a proof that the brain in the vat could use. Yeah. And that's <laughs> but if a brain in the vat can prove that it's not a brain in a vat, well, it's hard to feel that something's not gone. Uh, I mean, it's hard to feel that something must have gone wrong, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So although Putnam's proof seems very, I think it does seem very plausible and powerful, that it, we don't want a response to skepticism that's too good. There's a sense in which we want to be troubled by skepticism. Because if we had a really good satisfactory resolution, the brain in the vat could use it. You see what I mean? Okay, so these are just two background initial thoughts. So um, Putnam's, let me just work over Putnam's proof. Um, so the skeptic says, are the causes of my experiences as I take them to be, and we said last time the um, standard skeptical scenarios, are ones in which your experiences have causes but they're non-standard causes. They're, your sensations are figments of the heat-oppressed brain. They're produced by evil demons or madness or an evil scientist or a vat and vat-tending machinery. Something like that. Something not the regular tables and chairs and the other people is generating all these experiences in you. And the response to that is that, well, just as on Earth and on Twin Earth, we interpret your mental pictures we interpret your talk about water so that it comes out roughly right about the stuff in your environment. If you're on Earth, then we say, uh, this, when you talk about water, when you have this kind of mental image, that refers to um, H2O, because that's the stuff in your environment, that's the stuff that's causing this. On Twin Earth, we say, well, when you t people there talk about water, they have those kind of images. Um, that's about X, Y, Z, because that's the stuff there that's causally generating that, the, the, those images and thoughts. Um, well, if you're in a vat, then you're having those same images. You're using the word water and so on. But by just the same logic, by just the same argument, you are to be interpreted as talking about the stuff in your environment, which will be aspects of the vat tending machinery. So um, uh, there is going to be a question as to, OK, it works for water. And remember, we, worked, uh, we said last time we, we had these discussions about whether it works for um, kettle or I can't remember what the other examples were. Airplane. Airplane? We didn't talk about airplanes. God, it's completely gone. OK. <laughs> as, as, uh, airplanes. <laughs> right, thank you. Right. OK. Um, Okay. Um, okay, so uh, uh, maybe we could run this kind of argument for most of our vocabulary. Um, it's not, presumably, it's not going to work for words for sensations. Words for sensations are standing for the sensations that, how should I say, they're inside your head. So there's no possibility of lookalikes or something different in the environment being the referent. You can't have two nerve cases there. But if we just set the sensations aside for a moment, um, well, certainly the word vat itself. If you're in the vat, then what, what does the word vat stand for? Well, it stands for whatever is causally connected to your use of the word vat. That is not the name of a sensation. So presumably it will be subject to Putnam's argument. So if, you're, if, you, if we consider the brain in the vat, the use of vat in vat English has no causal connection to real vats. And here comes Putnam on a, with a tricky bit in the argument. Um, you might say, of course, it does have a causal connection to vats, because after all, the brain is in a vat, and um, it, it, it couldn't think anything at all. It couldn't say, it wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for the vat. So everything it does is causally connected to the vat. So the use of the vat, vat in vat English has no causal connection to real vats, apart from the connection that the brain's in a vat. Wouldn't be able to use the word vat if it were not for the presence of one particular vat, the vat they are in. Is it, this isn't going too fast. <laughs> um, but that connection obtains between the use of every word in VAT English and that one particular VAT. So uh, we had these discussions about what's the right kind of causal connection. Remember, that you're, you, you're talking about um, 
the computer, you're not talking, uh, the sun may be all that's letting you see the computer, but you're not thereby referring to the sun. The vat may be part of the background that makes it possible for you to refer to particular things, but it's not thereby what you're talking about. So the word vat in vat English has no causal, con no relevant causal connection to real vats. So if, you're a br if you are a brain in a vat and you utter the word, uh, words, I am a brain in a vat, then when you use them, they say something different to what they say in regular English, assuming that in regular English we're not actually in a vat. Is this getting too technical? Is, okay. Um, and so if you are a brain in a vat, then um, when you say I'm a brain in a vat, that will be saying something false. Because what you'd be saying is, you'd be talking about some um, configuration of the VAT tending machinery. You're talking about a VAT, and you aren't actually a configuration of the VAT tending machinery. You're a brain. Yes? So that would be false if you say I'm a brain and a VAT. In fact, brain wouldn't refer to brains either. Brain would refer to some configuration of the VAT tending machinery. You'd be saying that one, uh, you, yeah, so you'd be saying that you are a particular configuration of the VAT tending machinery which is wrong. Is that all right? Yeah. So there are two scenarios. One is the world is just the way you think it is. Um, here you are in this agreeable lecture room um, with all your colleagues and there's not a vat in sight. So if, if you're in that situation and you say, I'm a brain in a vat, you say something false. Yes? But it's also true that if you are a brain in a vat and you say the words, I'm a brain in a vat, then you also say something false. Yep. So you can't be a brain in a vat. I mean, you can't say something true by saying I'm a brain in a vat. Yes? Um, because, well, you can't say something true by saying I'm a brain in a vat, if you're a brain in a vat. Because if you're a brain in a vat, the words I'm a brain in a vat well, brain is going to stand for a configuration of the VAT tending machinery. VAT is going to stand for a configuration of the VAT tending machinery. So when you say the words, I'm a brain in a VAT, you're saying something false. Because you're not a configuration of the VAT tending machinery. Even in that situation, you're a brain. Yep. So um, you could, if you try it now, saying, I am a brain in a VAT, you know that, one thing you know is that that's false. Well, there you go. What more do you want? Bingo, <laughs> right? Um, and actually, so you, so you know you're not a brain in a vat. And, um, uh, and actually, how should I say, <laughs> even if you are a brain in a vat, then most of the sentence that you're using, um, e.g. there are birds in the trees, they're going to come out mostly true because they're all statements about configurations of the VAT tending machinery, and they'll mostly be right. So most of the things you would regularly say come out true. Yep? So, but when, if the I am a brain in a turns out false, because you're referring to the machinery. Yes, right. And you aren't, so then any time you say I am anything. Uh, I am anything. That's very interesting. Uh, 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 yeah, um, I am tall. Yeah, what would tall be? Yeah, I am tall. Yeah, tall's uh, uh, tall's a little bit difficult, d different. I am um, a brain in a vat is an identity statement, right? That would be one of these informative identities that we hear so much about. Yeah, um, but um, I am tall is not an identity statement. I am tall just says something like. Um, I am in a particular VAT configuration. Yeah, that is very interesting. Um, I think that's right. Um, I think. Um, the thing is, I said uh, maybe it's only words for sensations that don't work with the causal theory. Yeah. Um, 
But I is interesting here, and here is interesting, because I and here maybe are words that don't um, function in accordance with the uh, causal theory. What I mean is, with words like um, I and here, with I, you've got a rule. Anytime someone uses I, it refers to that person. It's something like that. So there's this absolutely rigorous rule, and it doesn't really matter who is causing anything. It's not really a causal notion. If you say here, anytime someone uses here, it refers to the place that person is at. Then there's just that absolutely rigorous general rule fixing the reference to the term, not something about what's causing the use of the term. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So when it says that, it's talking about some sort of picture that's in the head. That's right. That's right. But then it seems like saying, making true claims is contingent on, or certain true claims is contingent on the brain having personal experience of what it's talking about. That's right. So, but then, because the brain needs that configuration, it doesn't actually have experience of anything that's actually existing. So then, if it says, I exist, is that true? Mm -hmm. If it says I exist, uh huh. Existed. Yeah. Okay. That's very good. Yeah. The, um, um, could you have a twin Earth for existence? Um, where, I, 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 I mean, that's the basic question. Yeah. Uh, and could you have a twin earth for uses of I? Uh, uh, that's a way to frame what both of these uh, uh, things are raising, uh, right? Um, uh, I mean, it seems to me that you couldn't, for either of them, have a twin earth. Yeah. So, I, I mean, this is actually agreeing with your point. That I, th I think that's what makes the point, your point possible. Yeah? That um, these signs are getting meaning in a way that doesn't depend on a causal theory of reference. Okay, so yeah, so I, I just agree with that. Wait, 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 wait. It, it would be false. Um, well, I, I'm inclined to think it would be true, but um, that I exist. But uh, even if you, even if the brain in the vat says it, when it says I exist, that would be something true. But um, the thing is. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, like, the object statement is the brain itself is made. So, like, I can say the brain exists and have that be true, but if the brain says that, it's not speaking about the meta situation, it's speaking about its experiential object. That's right. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think in general that's right. I do wonder, though, what I mean about existence is, I wonder if that isn't an exception. Um, I don't think that helps Putnam. Yeah. Um, so I think you could present it as a dilemma. Either he says you could have a twin earth for existence, yeah, uh, in which case he goes down your track, and maybe it's going to come out that um, existence refers to a particular kind of vibration in the vat tending machinery. Yeah? Um, and uh, then when it says I exist, well, maybe, maybe it itself is not actually correlated with that kind of vibration in the vat tending machinery. Yeah, that would that, that, be the kind of point. Is um, on the other hand, I, th I think you could go down the other track, which is what I was suggesting, and say that seems daft because we think of we don't actually think of existence, uh, the notion of existence, as governed by a causal theory. Yeah, um, and then you see, no, it's got to be true when the brain says I exist. That's, if anyone in any context can say I exist, that's got to be right. Um, but the causal theory can't make sense of that. Okay, that's very interesting. I just hadn't thought of existence in this context. As, uh, 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 but I think that's right. There was someone over here. Yeah. Yeah, you mean you or, you or me talking about actual events? Yeah. Yeah. 
Sure. Th th that would be too strong. Y y uh, I mean, that would be the, you're right, that would be the wrong answer if you came to the conclusion. We can't talk about what was going on in the Middle Ages because we never directly experienced any of these people. Yeah, that can't be right. Um, but the important notion, I think, here is not um, directly experienced, but ca caused. Yeah. So people in the Middle Ages are causally connected to you or me. We are picking up on causal chains that go back to these people, so we think anyhow. Um, whereas the brain in the vat, um, let us suppose that at any rate it was born in the vat. I mean, it was, it, it was grown in the vat. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's not causally connected to any of the regular stuff. Yeah, that's what we really want. Yeah. Yeah. Plain as day? If you're not a little bit confused, you haven't really understood what's happening. Are you a little bit confused? <laughs> right. Okay. Um, okay, so um, these, last, the, 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 these are questions about I and existence. And I really want to... Uh, pick up on that, thinking particularly about um, sensations. So it seems to me, as, as I said, with I here now, um, it's not really that there's a general causal theory of reference uh, functioning. It's these systemic rules governing the use of the terms. If you say now, um, well, maybe there are time delays in your perception. Maybe you're in an environment where time is, um, there are time lags, you know, it takes, it takes, um, 30 minutes for the light to get from the chair over here. That could happen. You, you could just be in an environment where things go very slowly like that. Um, but then when you say now, you might usually be talking about stuff that happened. You might, that might be causally connected to stuff that was happening 30 minutes ago, if you see what I mean. But that would be an illusion. That would be a, you'd still be making a mistake. Because now always refers to the time at which you're speaking. So there's just a general iron rule here for these terms. Um, and what you're causally connected to is not so important. Um, or names for sensations. I mean, my picture here is pretty crude, but um, my intuitive picture here is, um, this is your mind, right? This is the world with all the trees and the vat tending machinery and the H2O and the XYZ, right? And all that stuff is causing things to happen in your mind. But your sensations, your headache, um, and all that, they're right in there. I mean, <laughs> they're too close to be causally connected to you, if you see what I mean. Um, you're surveying them in their entirety. It's not just that you're causally connected to them. Um, so when you think about um, what it is, what's going on when you use a word like pain, um, well, it seems like if I say, uh, are you hurting? Is your head sore? Then what I'm asking there is not uh, a question about whatever property is at the end of some causal chain. I know from my own case what pain is. You know from your own case what pain is. If you ask someone else, do they have a headache? You're asking whether they have that sensation that you have had so often. Um, so what's going on when people are skeptical about other minds is they say, maybe I'm the only sentient one. Maybe you guys are all just very clever zombies and um, you don't have sensations at all. But, um, or maybe something is going on, but it's completely unlike what is going on in my mind. How can we ever know? I mean, people very often feel that second kind of skepticism anyway. But you, you don't really know at all what's going on in someone else's mind. There's something alien about practically everybody else. Um, so that, when you raise that kind of question about other minds, when you ask about other people, are their sensations the same as mine? Or um, do they have experiences at all? Well, Putnam at some point seems to think that he's addressing that kind of skepticism too. Because the picture is, well, <laughs> maybe here we all are. Um, brains bobbing together in, the, in, in one giant vat. Maybe all the people that ever lived are just all bobbing about um, like apples in a bucket in, um, in, in, the, in the same big vat. Um, but of course, that's, that's not the right picture at all. 
because uh, if we're all brains in a vat, then there's no communication between you and me, if you, if you see what I mean, no direct communication. We're all just being fed by the vat, by the vat tending machinery. Um, so when, if you really took um, uh, Putnam's picture there seriously, what you'd be saying is, when I say pain, I'm referring to whatever out there usually causes me to use the word pain. But what's out there that usually causes me to use the word pain, if when I'm talking about other people's pain, is going to be um, some configuration of the vat tending machinery. Right? There's something in the vat tending machinery, some configuration of the chips in the vat tending machinery that send me a jolt, that make me say, oh, you've got a terrible headache, or you've hurt your arm. You see what I mean? But that's not how it works with pain. We know what pain is well enough from our own case. Um, Putnam's picture is that uh, Neo, if we can call our brain Neo, is um, uh, when Neo talks about pain, then Neo's talking, uh, uh, talking about states of the machinery or maybe even states of other brains in there. Um, so if you suppose that someone else is having a particular sensation, then um, this when I say you're ha other people have headaches, I'm not just talking about whatever it is that usually causes me to use those terms. I'm supposing that they have the same as I do. You know what the sensations and feelings are independently of any causal connections. So when I suppose that you're having a headache or um, a feeling of bliss, then I know what I'm talking about and it doesn't depend on what I'm causally connected to. So if I'm in the vat and I'm supposing that someone else is in a particular conscious state, that can't, it can't be right to interpret that as merely my supposing that some part of the machinery is in a particular machine state. You see what I mean? When Neo in the vat is supposing that these things around him all have feelings and sensations, that they all have conscious lives, um, that's not just a matter of getting particular synchronized firing in the vat tending machinery. So when you suppose someone else to be in a particular conscious state, you might be referring to something in the vat, but you're supposing that it's conscious in the same way you are. You know from your own case what consciousness is. And you're supposing that something else has that. So it seems to me Putnam's proof doesn't help a bit with skepticism about other minds. I mean, if you are in the vat and you formulate the thought, maybe I'm the only conscious thing in the universe, um, then you are correct in that hypothesis. It's not as if it gets formulated so as to, um, it gets reinterpreted so as to come out uh, true. So if you have these skeptical doubts, maybe no one else has feelings, maybe no one else has feelings the way I do, if you're a brain in the vat, all those doubts are correct, even in Putnam's theory. Because Putnam's theory can't apply towards like I, towards for sensations. Here ends the first lesson. I realize, it's, I realize it's a bit early for this kind of scenario. <laughs> I think it doesn't really matter. I mean, um, um, if, whether you're the only one or not, I mean, I, I think it's, when Putnam does that thing of supposing that the brains are all bobbing about there, um, it doesn't really affect the fundamental point that um, they're um, isolated from each other. Uh, they're all being dealt with by, they're all being stimulated by the vat tending machinery. Yeah. So if the regular causes of your uses of words are what's going on in the vat tending machinery, then when I say, maybe I'm the only, when I have this doubt, maybe I'm the only one in the room that actually is conscious, maybe everybody else is just moving and acting as though they're conscious. That, that is the skeptical thought. Yeah. Um, uh, there's evidence that they're conscious, but it's not conclusive, it might be misleading. Um, 
then uh, the mere fact that there are other brains around who happen to be occupying the same vat isn't going to, uh, I, I mean, I'm not referring to any of them because I'm not causally wired up to any of them. Yeah. Um, so when I have that doubt, maybe I'm the only conscious one, that's going to be true if I'm a brain in a vat. That's right. In the, and, and, and that's right. Nothing in the vat tending machinery is conscious. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's all right to, for Putnam to say, when I talk about trees and I say there are birds singing in the trees, that's just talking about configurations of the vat tending machinery. You can do, I, I, I actually agree, you can do that kind of reinterpretation there. But um, in the case of terms like conscious or feels pain, since I know from my own case exactly what I'm talking about here, and I'm supposing that that thing, whatever's going on in here, is also going on out there, then I get to keep, keep hold of the meanings of my signs, and it comes out meaning something false. Yep. That's right. If you aren't conscious. No, wait a minute. I <laughs> I'm taking it for granted that I'm conscious. Um, yeah, I mean that's the whole thing about the brain and the vat, right? It's conscious, all right. That's what. Yeah. To take me through this again, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a bit early for me too. <laughs> Yes. I see. Right. Okay. No, th th that's perfectly fair. I I um I slid over something there. I w w the way I the way I meant to keep putting it was to say I'm the only one in the room that is conscious. Yeah. Now, if you have if you can say something much more general, like I'm the only one in the universe that's conscious, yeah, then maybe that will come out false because there are these other brains and maybe they're all conscious too. Yeah. But w what I meant about um, uh, actual, when you actually do feel skeptical about other minds, what you mean is of all the people you know, you're the only one that's conscious. And that will be the thing that's coming out true for the brain and the that. Because it doesn't know anything about these other brains. Yeah, so all you guys will just be um, states of the vat tending machinery, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you can do this too, it's not that I'm the other one that gets to do this. Um, <laughs> yeah. Perfectly clear? Okay. Um, uh, so what I'm, the, the, the point there is that there's something you can hive off skepticism about other minds and say Putnam's proof, um, even uh, however good it is, it just doesn't seem to work for skepticism about other minds. It doesn't help with skepticism about other minds because the key terms don't seem to be subject to a causal theory of reference. Yeah. So you don't have to agree with that, but it's very important you see that you see what the idea is, anyhow. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Um, well, I've been saying so far that skepticism is um, all, you can always uh, put skepticism as a question about what the causes of your experiences are. But it's not obvious that's really essential to skepticism. I, it's very natural when you're trying to explain to someone what skepticism is to say, well, maybe um, it's all a dream or maybe it's just states of the vat tending machinery or something like that. Um, that helps people get how skepticism might be true. But suppose the skeptic said, forget all this stuff about vats, forget all this stuff about evil geniuses and dreaming and um, uh, demons and so on. That, that, that's all just stage setting. The really critical puzzle is... Suppose that all that's going on 
right as you sit here is that you are having a procession of sensory images and maybe there is nothing more to the universe than that procession of sensory images. So maybe they have no causes at all. Maybe that's all that is going on. There isn't any causation. Suppose a skeptic says that. I mean, that seems like um, just another form of skepticism. So all that there is constituting the entire universe is that procession of images in the void. That's the whole thing. So that's skepticism, all right. So what does Putnam say to that? Well, and what would be the right Putnam reaction to that? All that's going on, the whole universe, is, as you sit there, you're getting one sensory impression after another, and that's the whole thing. No causes. Well, if you have a causal theory of reference and thought, then if there are no causes, then you don't have those causal or contextual connections that are needed for you to be thinking about anything. So if, there are no, if, it re, if we consider the hypothesis that there are only images and the void, then the right conclusion is that you're not thinking. You're just having a bunch of sensory impressions. Yeah? Descartes thought that um, when you get to the existence of your own thoughts, that's the fundamental certainty uh, from which um, you, you are all on which all the rest of knowledge depends. But what Putnam's shown is really, it's not that he's helped against the skeptic. He's actually just made things worse. Because Descartes thought, well, maybe it's all a dream, maybe it's all illusion, um, but still in all, I have my thoughts, and I know about my own thinking, and that much is certain. And the causal theory of reference hasn't helped at all because now the skeptic can reformulate in such a way where if the skeptic puts skepticism as a hypothesis that there are only images in the void, then the skeptic can attack even the idea that you know about your own thoughts. So Putnam hasn't helped. Look, there's a kind of um, um, a scary story due to Donald Davidson that... Um, uh, gives another way of putting this point. Suppose this scene, suppose it's midnight out on the outskirts of town and suddenly a bolt of lightning hits a swamp and by some peculiar chemical biological reactions, I don't really have the vocabulary to explain to you exactly what happens, but as the lightning hits the swamp, some strange set of reactions comes in place and out from the ooze, there clambers a figure, which um, is, first of all, you realize it's alive. Um, and then you realize it looks exactly <laughs> like you. It's not just like you, it's molecule for molecule identical to you. So it clambers out, dusts itself off. Now... What is Swamp Man thinking about? Suppose you were thinking about those happy days when you were five years old and you were sick at your birthday party. Um, could sw Swamp Man's go to have those kind of images going through their head? But are they thinking about the same event, the same people? No, of course not. Why not? Because, not a, because what do we need to be thinking about particular people from the past class? Causal connections. Does Swamp Man have causal connections to any of these people? No, Swamp Man didn't exist two minutes ago. Swamp Man just got generated by the bolt of lightning. Right, so Swamp Man isn't thinking about anything on a causal theory of reference, right? Because, I mean, all they can be thinking about is the swamp. Yes? Um, so they, even though they're molecule for molecule identical to you, they're not thinking about anything at all. Um, and now suppose that uh, what we do is um, 
So the, 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 that was Davison's idea. A bolt of lightning hits the swamp. And then what comes out might have sensations, but it doesn't have thoughts. Not the way you do. Um, but now suppose that what happens is that as you come into the class, um, we show you the video. Um, we say, look, this is what happened last night. A bolt of lightning hit the swamp. You've only just cleaned all that stuff off you. You were only generated from the swamp last night. Everything before that in your apparent memories is actually just an illusion. Is that a contradiction? That could happen. Yeah, we could prove to you that you, didn't, you weren't causally connected to any of those things. So the only thing you could do in that situation would be to conclude that you're not thinking. Yeah? If we showed you the video. So you could actually have it proved to you that you're not thinking. So this is what I mean about the skepticism has only got worse. We started out with the idea that you might be doubtful about the concrete objects around you, but your own mind, you know about that all right. But what's ha the, the connection that the causal theory makes between the world around you and the constitution of your mind, that's not helping against skepticism. It just means that the reach of skepticism goes further than you might have thought. If the whole world goes, then your mind goes too. If the whole physical world goes, then you can't be thinking. Yep. Yeah, it's a very paradoxical situation. Um, uh, uh, all I can suggest is that you could go through the motions of thinking that you're not thinking. As you see, I mean, you could use all the right words, but it would, in a sense, be just empty talk. Because only none of these signs would really mean anything. On the other hand, if you say this is not possible, if I think I'm thinking that I'm thinking, or if I'm going through the motions of thinking that I am thinking, yes? Suppose you say that, it doesn't matter what's going on around me. Then that's just to deny the causal theory. Because that's to treat your mind as if it's insulated from your environment, and you know all about what's going on in here. But that's what happens with the causal theory, it, it blows that up. So, since you can't know just by reflection that you have these causal or contextual connections to your world, then you can't know just by reflection that you're thinking. So something really powerful happens when you have a causal theory of reference to the um, Cartesian picture of the mind, to Descartes' picture of the mind, which is the natural picture of the mind. I mean, most people, I think, have this, that I know what's going on in here. Other people maybe don't. Um, and certainly I know what's going on in here, whatever's going on out there. Uh, that's a very natural picture to have. But the causal theory is just blowing that up. So what Putnam wanted the causal theory of reference to show was that you know all the things you think you know. But what I'm suggesting is it's, much what, it's, it's not really that much help. All it, show, all it does is it explains to you how it could be happening that although it seems to you as though you're thinking, you're not really thinking. Because you could have that kind of swamp man scenario. I mean, <laughs> you keep hoping we're going to make progress, but there you go. Um, and notice, incidentally, how this goes back to that basic point that we were looking at with Russell and Frege and so on, about meaning without reference. That the causal theory is saying you can't have meaning without reference. Um, and that's really what's at the heart of this, the, the, the points here. Um, on a Descartesian picture, you can have meaning without reference. And you can, so you can hold on to the meaning, whatever's going on out there for you to refer to. Um, I just want to make one last uh, uh, brief comment about, um, even if you suppose that you are having thoughts, if you have a causal theory of reference, 
do you know which thoughts you're having? I mean, if you get the Earth, twin Earth, and the VAT scenarios, then the idea is you can have the same picture in all of these scenarios. Yeah? I mean, the same picture in your head in all these scenarios. But um, you'll be having different thoughts because this will be a thought about uh, H2O, this will be a thought about XYZ, and this will be a thought about um, that tending machinery. Yeah. The thing is, you know, what, what, what you now realize is that just by reflecting on your own mind, you don't know which of these thoughts you're having. So even if you are thinking, if you have a causal theory of reference, you don't know what you're thinking. You don't know which of these you're thinking. Yeah? Um, so we have less knowledge of our own minds than we thought. Um, and you might say, people, it's been quite a popular thing for philosophers to say, well, whichever of these scenarios I'm in, I can say that, well, I'm thinking about water. So you do know that you're think what you're thinking about. You're thinking about water. Um, and whichever environment you're in, if you're, whichever of these three environments you're in, when you say, I'm thinking about water, you're going to be right. So you might say, I do know what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about water. And then if you're in this environment, water gets hooked back to the H2O, water gets hooked back to the XYZ, gets hooked back to the um, uh, uh, electrical impulses and the VAT tending machinery. Um, so you say, well, I, I do know what I'm thinking about. But the thing is, that just shows that that way of, how should I say, calibrating, that way of um, expressing which thought you're having doesn't really, isn't really sensitive to which thought you're having. I mean, in this context, you can say, I'm thinking about water. In this context, you can say, I'm thinking about water. In this context, you can use the words, I'm thinking about water. It always comes out right. But that just shows that that way of expressing what you're thinking about is actually insensitive to which particular thought it is that you're having. And Wittgenstein once said, um, um, I know how tall I am. I'm this tall. Right? We could do, each of us could do that. I could say, I'm really good at heights. I know the height of everyone in the room. You're this tall, this tall, this tall. And I always get it right. Yeah? Um, and you say, God, what a talent. Um, <laughs> what a gift. <laughs> right? um, um, and there is a sense in which when I do that, I am indicating a height. You know, there's, there's no question about that. But the thing is that that way of specifying heights isn't any good. I mean, I, the, the, the very thing that guarantees I always get it right is also the way that the sense, it's not as if, I mean, what you really want is some independent measure that you can match everyone up against. Yeah? Then you know what, that, that, that would be a different thing. If I could say 5 feet 10, 5 feet 11, 6 feet 3, whatever. If I've got some independent yardstick for measuring heights. What, what this kind of scenario shows is that um, saying, I'm thinking about water, doesn't give me an independent measure of what it is that I'm thinking. It's something that whatever environment I'm in, it gives, it gives me a correct report of what the thought is, but it doesn't actually give me an independent measure or an independent way of calibrating um, which thought there is I'm having because it's insensitive to this distinction. Just because of these distinctions, it just, it's like the putting the hand in the head, it's just guaranteed to always get it right. Um, so I think there is a real sense in which in this picture um, you don't know what you're thinking. Um, even if you're having thoughts, you don't know whether you're having thoughts in the first place, um, but even if you are having thoughts, you haven't got any insight into which thoughts you're having. So this locking between the mind and the world that the causal theory gets, I mean, as I say, I think there is something very important about Putnam's um, picture there, but Putnam treats it as though well, you know what you're thinking all right, and from that you can generate your knowledge of the world. That's how the proof is working. But it seems to me it's also possible to run this backwards and say, um, since I don't have certain knowledge of what the world is, it follows that I don't have the kind of certain knowledge of what's going on in my mind that we always assumed we did have. And on that bombshell, um, we'll, <laughs> we'll wrap in that on Putnam next time. Thanks.